Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, community forum tonight for the new elementary school building project. Uh, my name is, for anybody that doesn't know, my name is Dennis Francis. I'm on the school committee, and I'm also the uh, chairman of the building committee. Um, so tonight's um, meeting will be uh, broadcast live on TV, and it'll also be shown later. So we're going to do a uh, uh, very similar to what we've done in the past. The only thing that I ask is it's going to be a presentation. I want to try to hold all questions until the presentation is over, and then we'll have plenty of time for any questions, and we'll answer the questions uh, the best that we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Collins and to Kent, uh, OPM, and our architect. <coughs> Good evening, Peter Collins from CBRE, working as the town's owner's project manager. And here, this Donna. One second. I'll ask the audiovisual guy to. Well, that's better. Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> okay. Good evening again. Peter Collins, uh, working for a company called CBRE as the owner's project manager on behalf of the town of Tewksbury and the Tewksbury Elementary School um, Building Committee. So we're here this evening, myself and, and Kent Kovacs and his team as the design teams to introduce and talk about the proposed elementary school project here in the town of Tewksbury. This project um, started out about almost uh, five years ago when the building committee started to introduce the project to the MSBA. The MSBA is an acronym for the Massachusetts School Building Authority. That is a state agency that provides state grant funding to public schools K through 12 throughout the Commonwealth. It's a rather rigorous application process. The town of Tewksbury is in a very good position because they've been Im invited into the project, into the pipeline for the MSBA. We are currently in a feasibility and schematic design phase only. There's multiple phases that you go through with the state, and there are checkpoints along the way. So right now, for the last five years or so, the building committee has been applying to the state <clears throat> to be introduced into the program. They were introduced back in 2017, and for about the last 18 months, we've been working on exploring the conditions of the existing elementary schools, proposing some solutions to the, uh, to the problems with the schools as far as infrastructure, educational programs as well. We, are, we just concluded the schematic design submission, which is essentially, and I'll have Kent get into it, we just submitted our program called the schematic design to the MSBA on January 2nd. That was the full package, what includes the project scope and the overall project budget, and we'll talk about that later this evening. Uh, in, in terms of the MSBA, as it shows right up there now, it is a public agency within the state. It is a rather rigorous program. It is rather prescriptive. Currently, this phase of the project, the town of Tewksbury is receiving 52% reimbursement of state funding of eligible cost. If the project moves forward, we're hoping to increase that percentage to approximately 55%. That's our number. That has to be filtered and vetted by the state because there are some incentive points the town of Tewksbury will receive above and beyond the 52% sustainability, construction management at risk, and the town and the school district has had good maintenance programs, which we're hoping to get an additional 1.5% on top of that. At this point, I'll have Kent Kovacs from Flansburg Architects begin to speak about the design and what their uh, design team members have been performing over the last uh, several months. Thank you, Peter. Uh, as Peter had said, the this process has been going on for five years. Uh, there was a need to address the schools in Tewksbury, and the uh, school building committee submitted a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Trahan project. They looked at that school and they said, yes, you are in need of some repairs. This is not a school conducive for learning today. And there are many communities across the Commonwealth that want to be in your same position because they're willing to partner with your community and help fund part of the school. 
And so we're in the schematic design phase. There's three phases that led up to this. The preliminary design program, that's when many sites are evaluated. The program's evaluated what should be in this project. It's refined in the uh, PSR stage, and now we're in schematic design, uh, ready to submit this back to the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority for approval um, coming up in February. And it is important to note that the preferred option, the option that's been developed, was approved back in August. So they saw the educational value of uh, what's being proposed that you'll see tonight. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to uh, the superintendent to give us a little bit of background on the educational value of this preferred option. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, certainly, uh, this project we feel is very important to the children of Tewksbury. And when looking at the existing conditions of some of our current schools, I think the community shares the concern that some of the buildings our students are being educated in are inadequate, and we need to address those. Um, if anyone here or anyone on TV would certainly like to tour any of uh, our existing K-4 elementary schools, I'd be happy to give a personal tour of those facilities so you can look at some of the conditions. We were visited by the Commissioner of Education uh, about six weeks ago paid a visit to Tewksbury, and uh, we gave him a tour of some of our existing conditions in Tewksbury. So it is something we are certainly motivated to address. Uh, we have allocated over the past three years significant amounts of our school budget to maintain our current buildings, separate from a new building project. Uh, approximately 10 to 12 percent of our budget uh, is pushed towards uh, capital issues within our buildings. Uh, our buildings require that. We have buildings that are six years old. We have buildings that are 20, 30 years old. They all require significant maintenance. What we don't want to happen is any of our existing buildings to get in the condition that some of our K through four buildings are currently in. So the goal of trying to address this project to a bringing all grades two, three, and four from across the town into a new single building would be to take advantage of this shared educational experience. Currently, we have seven school buildings across the district. Because of conditions of the buildings, students can experience different educational opportunities. We're very proud of our teaching staff. We're very proud of our professional development. We're very proud of the curriculum we bring to the students. At times, we're hampered by the fact that we have seven schools spread out all over the town. This would allow us to bring that educational experience not only together for all grades two, three, four, but put them on the same campus as the existing five, six. That will allow us to have a continuum of instruction, a continuum of opportunities for professional development, collaboration for teachers, easiness for parents as far as having a location where they can certainly uh, have their students attend school, not across town at multiple different schools, but in one location. But it also provides us the opportunity to be a progressive school district and to consolidate some of the resources that we have when it comes to special education, maintenance resources, we're spreading that out over seven buildings. To be able to consolidate that into a new building should allow us to save costs on that element as well. Um, also the ability right now in grades two through six to have cross-grade experiences. Right now we're in separate smaller schools. Those students are in a very small contained world, which is actually very good. Programmatically, and research tells us, it can limit their instruction. We want to improve our ability to do that. We're confident that a school project that is designed to have them in smaller communities within a bigger building will achieve that. Um, So when we look at those benefits uh, that the superintendent was speaking to, 
Um, that goes far back. That goes back five years. And also, when we came on board, we interviewed the teachers, the faculty, and we understood their concerns. We went to every school. This is not just at the Trahan. We went to Heathbrook and North and Dewing and Trahan, and we sat with the teachers and understand their concerns. And when they looked at the options that were being considered from a neighborhood school that was small, similar to Trahan, to uh, a 3-4, to a grades 2 th to through 4, that was the option that resonated with all the teachers because they realized this is an opportunity for the students to come together, um, not just in fifth grade, but early on. The parents can get together and know each other early on and as well as the teachers, which was the biggest benefit. So they can look at the students coming together in grade two on a campus and be able to, you know, understand culturally uh, and kind of educationally, you know, kind of their student body. And again, bringing the students on early to campus and having the shared resources resonated with the teachers during the multiple days we had those faculty uh, and staff interviews. Um, when we step back and we look at it, the Trahan, it's 67 years old. Uh, there is a lack of ventilation air. The cafeteria is uh, sorely lacking ventilation air. Doesn't meet code. There is water infiltrating into the special edge need spaces. You can see that the carpets are wet. Now, this is not a lack of maintenance or care. The school has been extremely resourceful in the Trahan in the north over the years. When the MSBA came to see it, they realized this is more than cosmetics. And I will tell you, we, we were delighted we won in the Trahan. We saw all the murals. It was beautiful. The kids celebrated their work everywhere. But what really was happening is they were masking the problems behind it. And the MSBA understood that, and they recognized that. There, there is a severe need here, and they said the Trahan building project is going to come forward, and that was put on before a lot of other towns who had the same need. So you're in a good place right now. And part of this project is um, we wish we could tell you if uh, you didn't support this project in uh, the spring that they would be there with the money, but they're not. You're going to go back to square one. You're going to be 10 years out waiting to get back in the queue for a building project. And what we do know is the Trahan and the North were built at the same time. They're companion schools. They're in the same condition. There's no fire protection system. There's virtually no insulation in the walls. I mean, pretty much the windows are just blocking out the wind if they that's kind of do a poor job at that as well. There's a lot of leaks. And again, it's just not conducive to learning. There's a lot of acoustic issues, a lot of lighting issues, and a lot of temperature issues, which makes it uncomfortable for the students to focus on. That's common with both schools. Uh, as part of the MSBA, we're required to look at the tray hand and the cost to bring it up to code. Again, finishes as well, some furniture. And so to bring the tray hand up to code, is between 18 to 22 million dollars. That is not supported by the state. We're required to do it as an option for this project so they can see what the baseline would be to bring that neighborhood elementary school up to code. Um, again, the North Street is in the same condition, 67 years old, built at the same time. That again, is another 18 to $22 million. So you're looking at a big price tag. I, 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 this is not just cosmetic. There are major code issues here with both buildings. And to bring it up to code for both buildings, you're looking at 38 to $44 million that will not be supported by the state. It's very important everybody knows that. What will be supported by the state is the preferred alternative that has already gone through the process, which is an all district grades two to four. So part of the pro process, again, aside from doing existing conditions, uh, which we actually went and did existing conditions of all four elementary schools, because the second grade is also part of the mix, so we wanted to understand what the condition was at Heathbrook, also at Doing, so we have a general idea of what those costs would be and what the space needs are within those elementary schools. Uh, we also looked at many different sites, six different sites um, that are town-owned sites, <coughs> And this was to study the different grade options. And um, if you would advance it. But you see North Street, 
Chandler Well, Easement Road, Trahan, the Ryan School, these are all different sites in different kind of geographical areas. Also, that's important to know because if the preferred option was the all district grade 2 4, is, there, if it, is it shifted off the center of gravity if it's on the south side or the east side? So we wanted to understand where that should kind of live geographically. And so all these are considerations. Uh, we looked at buildable area, natural features, and then the disruption to students and staff because many of these sites had schools on them already. Go to the next slide. So these are some of the options that we looked at. Uh, we looked at the uh, uh, grade three and four that was uh, half the population in neighborhood schools, so it's basically the status quo over place in the tray hand. We looked at all district grades three and four. We looked at many different sites, and um, if you just advance it to the next one. Um, but just to give you an example of how thorough um, we had our engineers look at this, we had surveys conducted, and so Chandler Well, this is a site uh, that is heavily uh, heavy wetlands and heavily vegetated. So as you can see, the indication in kind of the green with the line going through, that's a water source with, with uh, a lot of wetlands. But it had a lot of square footage. And so that was a site to look at. And so you see kind of to the south, that was an opportunity to locate a new school for 790 students. Some of the main concerns here is, one, the disruption to the natural environment that you can see we're shoehorning in the building and the corner underneath wetlands. There's actually wetlands in between the parking and the building, as you see. Um, and then access. Access from the town center, access for emergency responders. How do we get in and out of this site? So this was not a viable solution, but this was one of the sites that was evaluated. Um, easement Road. Uh, this was actually quite a beautiful site. It was heavily wooded. Uh, we walked it, uh, but it's mature trees. It has walking paths throughout it. On kind of the east side, you're looking over wetlands. Uh, but you certainly could build a school for 790 students off of Eastman Road. Uh, the main concern was it was Eastman Road itself. It's about 20 feet wide, lined by houses on both sides. Um, that road would have to be removed, expanded, and we'd have to find another way to access for emergency responders to get to this. So this would be highly disruptive to a neighborhood as well as the natural environment. So this site was taken off the table. Uh, this was a smaller school for 525 students. Again, we are looking at everything. Uh, this was at Heathbrook, and you can see that there's parking in the front, a school for 525 students, and play area. Again, we have the wetlands kind of pushing us and holding that edge to the north. And if you've been at Heathbrook and you go to the play area in the back, you can see how the asphalt kind of runs down and sheets into the wetlands. And you might look there and say, how could you ever build a building here? Well, you can shoehorn it in, certainly. And that's what this option kind of illustrates. You can see the existing Heathbrook in black right there, that, you know, solid black. Uh, so once the new school was built, the Heathbrook would have to be demolished. And so where do the second graders go, you know, in that school? Where do the, where do the kids of the Heathbrook go? Um, the, actually, the, the, the kindergarten first and second. Um, they would actually have to go to the North Street. So. We're looking at every options, and I know it's hard to kind of understand that, but again, this was only for grades three and four. So Heathbrook, which is a K-2, they'd have to get displaced and move out. So you're just creating another problem. But again, our job was to look at any site that we could fit a building on with those different grade configurations. Okay, next slide. Uh, we looked at North Street. This could only accommodate the smaller option of, grade, of 265 students, as well as a tray hand. But again, that would be in the back, up against the edge of uh, the floodplain. And that would be a building that would be built within the floodplain. And we'd have to have a lot of compensatory storage for that. Um, and again, the 24 months why that building is constructed would disrupt the students, because you're right up against it. And then tray hand, 
Um, this is what the project was based on. You could get 265 students along the back edge, right up against the neighbors. Uh, that's 24 months of construction. We'd have to demo, do some portables because it's a really tight site. Uh, but you could build a smaller school. At the end, when we looked at the educational benefit, and we listened to the teachers, and this is the ninth community forum. The, I'll say the first six community forums focused on education. And the uh, grade two, four really came to the top. And that's what we heard, and that's what was submitted for the preferred option of the project, and that's why we're here today. So, so again, the solution, the Ryan site, it's centrally located. It's near first responders. You have the fire station, the police station, town hall. You have the high school down the street. And it has buildable area. It has dry buildable area for a building for 790 students in the center of town. And those were some of the main reasons why it was selected. Uh, but the fact that it could live with the grades five, six elementary school. So you had a two through six elementary school campus, by far won people over in the beginning of the community forums. Uh, so you could have um, the teachers, the parents would know each other, the students would know each other, there's mentoring opportunities for the older kiddos to come to the younger school. They could share the play area. Uh, so there was a lot of resources that were shared on this campus. And um, when we look at designing campuses, that's what we look for. How can we consolidate resources? Uh, not only logistically, parking, drop-offs, uh, but then the campus experience, play areas, outdoor learning space. You know, how can we make something wonderful and create a true campus that the kids are proud of? And um, that's where we are today. And advance that. And so the building, as you see, is located on the east side of the site over the existing Doucette Field. We looked at it as well on the west side. Uh, that was really close to the wetlands. That would displace the wetlands. There'd be a lot of technical engineering to do that. And it's really not the right thing to do to put a two and three story building right on the edge of wetlands. What it also did, it created a disconnect and put the building in the back of the site. By locating it on the east side of the site, we were able to capture those educational opportunities for a shared bus drop off, parent drop off, and play areas. And the area right between the two schools, that could be a really controlled uh, area for gardens, uh, for an amphitheater, for performances, and also support, you know, kind of town functions. You could have a farmer's market in there, if you will. And so we were able to capture some really unique uh, spaces along the streetscape, if you will, between the two schools. And I invite everybody to take a look at this concept model, because uh, it really starts to, you know, give you a, a, a sense of uh, what can be achieved uh, uh, with the building next to the, um, the other building and as part of a greater campus. Uh, and number three and four, it's a blue shaded area. It's not a pool. It's play areas. So that's where the Ryan School and the New School, they can share resources. As well, the biggest resource is the new synthetic multi-purpose field that you can use for PE and recess. So both schools have plenty of space for the kids to run around. I think that's a great benefit to this campus uh, layout that you have not only great educational spaces, but you have great educational spaces outside the building that are shared. Uh, we have a one-way vehicular loop road around the campus. What that does, it's one way. That's the way we always do it. It's 24 feet wide. That allows the cars to come off Pleasant Street and get in the queue and wrap all the way around the campus. It's going to take some time for the parents to get used to it, but what's happening right now, they're coming to the Ryan School, and they have about 150 feet of queuing space. They back up onto Pleasant Street. It's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. They come in about 150 feet, and then they turn around. Never should happen. Never should happen. We need to pull all the cars off of Pleasant Street. That will help alleviate some of the backup that happens there during pickup and drop off, and bring them onto campus. As they go around the entire campus, Loop Road, they drop off between the two schools, uh, kind of at the number six and the number two. That's for the parents. The buses are handled in front of the Ryan School. The buses that drop off kids for school, they're 
maintained in the front of the school and they go right back to Pleasant. The buses do not go around the entire campus. Okay? So the buses are controlled in the front of the school while the parents go all around the school again, creating that nice storage uh, capacity we like with the cars queuing up. Uh, part of the project was to, uh, again, replace some of the amenities from the Doucette Field. So we have uh, uh, bleachers, we have a concession stand with toilets, a field house, and also uh, in that area um, was uh, some practice areas and baseball. We're trying to capture some of that area over on the east side of the, um, the site. Uh, along with some supplemental parking. So we're not trying to take away from program that exists now. We're trying to still provide it on site. Okay, next slide. Uh, just kind of look at the plan. These are not entirely clear, but essentially there's a community portion kind of to the south side with a large cafeteria that can support the students' everyday use as well as the greater community for after school and evening events. And then two academic um, wings off to the north side. So the second grade is on the first floor, third grade on the second floor, and fourth grade on the third floor. And uh, really take a look at the model because you can see uh, how the massing relates to the overall site and you can see how the grades kind of would interact. Um, there's a great outdoor learning space that's carved out of the center we can imagine uh, kind of reading nooks and maybe a small little amphitheater out there for performances. We have art that opens up to that as well as an innovation science space that opens up to the outdoor classroom. So it's a great use of space and it also brings uh, an abundant of natural light uh, kind of deep into the plan. So we really want to play up natural light. It always makes the kids feel great. Uh, as well as we're creating team spaces for each grade. So there's a second grade team room that's kind of in the center of the plan with a third grade team room and a fourth grade team room. Could advance it, yep. Uh, you can see on the left side, we have a 10,000 square foot gymnasium there. And then the library's on the second floor as well. And then again, the third grade is located on the second floor. And advance the slide. And then the fourth grade is accessed uh, on the third floor. And uh, they have roof access to uh, some um, uh, green roof sections. Uh, that's an educational tool uh, and, and just a great, uh, nice feature for when you have a flat roof to put some pavers and a green roof on it. But again, take a look at the model and you'll get a better idea of what we're, uh, we're kind of illustrating here. Uh, next plan. So let's take a look at some of the, I'll say some of the innovative spaces and some of the community use spaces. So here's what we call a 3D view of the media center that's on the lower side here on the second level. So that would be on the second level. So you have the second grade on the first, third grade on the middle, and fourth grade. So it's right central uh, between the different grades, as well as the large um, cafeteria and then the gymnasium. So you can see that the community spaces are kind of up front. And we're working with the security consultant and the district to see how we should zone the academic wing so we can lock them off from the community use. Next slide. Um, here's a nice little detail. We have the cafeteria that has a stage and a music room. And when we were interviewing uh, the folks at the North Street School, it was really interesting because they said, are you going to do one of those cafetoriums we see in every elementary school where it's the cafeteria tables and you have the stage punched out? And they said, well, why can't you create a theater that just happens to host dining? You know, kind of flip it on its, you know, hat. And so that's what we did. So the stage is part of the dining space. And so when you walk into this, you're going to see the technical lights. We're going to be able to have curtains to the courtyard. And so it's really going to feel and promote the arts, which we think is going to be great, really innova uh, 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 innovative. Also, we have an arrow for if there's a reception and you want to spill to the outdoor classroom, you can do so. Uh, but again, we have two music rooms uh, supporting the space. The North Street, they use the gymnasium. So it's kind of uh, a distraction. So they lack that space. Okay. Again, the outdoor classroom, we have the cafeteria connection, we have the art, and then we have the team rooms, again, utilizing the outdoor classroom. Uh, we also have an innovation space that has greenhouses as part of it. So there's a second grade greenhouse, a third grade, and a fourth grade greenhouse as part of uh, the program, which we think is going to be uh, super. 
And we just want to stress on this slide, the team room that you see along kind of that curvy edge, right in the center, each grade has that. Not only the students should be supported, but the teachers need to be supported. And part of the MSBA, they give you guidelines, but there's a little bit of a lack when it comes to elementary schools with the MSBA guidelines. They don't give the teachers a lot of planning space or meeting space. And when you have a high school project, they give the teachers uh, a lot more square footage so you can have proper offices and breakout spaces. So on an elementary level, to support the teachers, we have to be creative. And so these team rooms can support the students but it also can be a professional development space as well. So we can imagine this, you know, lined with probably a copy machine and storage. They can have uh, uh, whiteboards and we can have different types of desks for the teachers. So again, we want to make these common spaces uh, conducive for both uh, students and maximize the use for the teachers. And so that's been the dialogue for the last six months in the design. How can we take this MSBA space template and then make it uniquely Tooksbury. And I think this you know, represents the outcome of uh, a lot of hard work uh, with all the teachers along the way. Next slide. Um, and then just kind of a close up of the uh, athletic field in the back. This is a multi purpose field, it can be used for many different sports um, the bleachers, the concession stand, the, uh, the uh, field house. And then again, this is for the school use as well. So the students can use this during PE and um, for recess, which uh, would be great. So, uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nick Kavan from Niche Engineering. He's our traffic engineer who's been with us since the beginning. Uh, he's conducted two traffic surveys and just going to give us an update on uh, what it means to bring this school to the Ryan School uh, site. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Do we have the? Okay, so. We put together a little slide um, presentation that was done November 15, but some of the slides have been revised since then. Uh, oh, okay, I, I hear myself. I think everybody can hear too. Sorry. Um, so in this um, presentation, I'm going to talk about the traffic study for the, for the Tewksbury Elementary School. It's going to include the introduction. It's uh, introduction is going to be locus plan, and then we're going to go into the existing condition and pr uh, compare the proposed condition with it for the elementary school with a two to four, grade four in addition. And we, we, we'll have time for the question and answer. So the new school program um, is going to uh, have a grades two to four, as it says over there, 790 students. Uh, the release time is, around, uh, is at 3.10. The existing Ryan School has, uh, which is the f 5 to 6th grade, 576 students. Their release time is a little bit earlier at 2.30 p.m. Um, we are est estimating approximately 150 administration and staff for the teachers and sta for the staff. <coughs> so to be conservative in our studies, we, we're going to be using uh, a total of 1,516 uh, total number for uh, generating the traffic. Um, the drop-off based on that is going to be, uh, we're estimating about 409, and the pickup is going to be 209. Uh, we will have 16 buses and four minibuses. And just to add to that, if you go back one, just to emphasize. Please. So the 1516, that's the combination of that total, let's just say, is the worst case scenario. That's the combination of the Ryan and the new school all together. It will never happen. The schools are staggered. So that's very important for everybody to understand. But for his purposes, there's standards that it has to be within one hour. So he's combining both schools at 1,500 trips or 1,500. Um, for worst case scenario, but that we know is not the case because there's a 40 minute stagger time between drop off and pickup. So again, he's going to give you the results of, again, the worst case scenario. So this talks about the level of service. That's, that's the, basically what we analyze and come up with a level of services for the, how the intersections and uh, a traffic 
section operates, level of service. It's, it's graded like a school grading from A to F, A meaning the best one, which, which has the, uh, the least delay, and uh, F is the maximum delay over 80 seconds. Uh, we did some counts on different intersections, and we did also do an ATR counts, counts which is an automatic traffic records those wires that they, they lay on a street, the cars go over them. And we came up with uh, existing volumes. Um, and based on those existing volumes, the level of services are indicated here. The big ones with the cir circles that says C over C, that those are AM and PM um, level of services for um, signalized intersections. The other intersections, they are unsignalized, and we are showing the approach, approaches to the uh, level of service on the approach to the intersection. Um, for example, uh, it's difficult to see, but there are so, some areas over here, like. Those are, approaches are C, some of them are F, existing like this one. Helvetia uh, Street in the mornings is, is uh, the approach fails. But in the afternoon is level of service D. So this is the existing conditions. And then the, oh. I, I have the thing, right? No. How does it go? Yeah. Which, which slide do you want? Uh, the one. The built? No, the one before. Uh, the, no, the built one. Right. So for the built level of service, we had to project our volumes for seven years. We, we used um, <laughs> Mass DOT's uh, station. Um, continuous count station, which is on Main Street. And uh, it indicated that on the past 13 years, it has, the, the volumes actually have decreased 22%. Um, so that means about a, a percent and a half per year. But for us to be on the conservative side, we estimated an increase of 1% just to cover uh, other uh, developments that might happen in, in so we came up with a we projected that over seven years and then we use those numbers to to do the built level of service and actually the level of services ha has not changed drastically so um, most of them stay the same so those are the list of recommendations that we we're gonna uh, we, we develop uh, continuing in, um, designating the Pleasant Street as a school zone, um, pedestrian experience and on a Pleasant Street can be enhanced by the improvement to the sidewalks and uh, accessible ramps. Um, advanced wa warning signs uh, we are recommending to be installed for the s school entrances and reach out to the parents. Yep, that, that's great. Uh, Peter, just go away. Yeah, so did everybody kind of understand the existing evaluation had Pleasant Street as an A rating coming through, which means there's no stop signs. You're kind of going through and there's no delay based on those different gradings. So it was an A. And the bubbles off to the side show the uh, secondary streets coming in with their ratings. Um, and then when you add and you project out that volume of the students, that worst case scenario, and kind of projecting out, um, you still have an A rating along Pleasant Street. Main Street hasn't changed, um, and then I think some of the secondary streets either have, have slightly improved, some, some of them have improved. Um, so with bringing the students on, and this is the second report that's been conducted, there is no change to the traffic if anything, it's improving because we're creating that storage capacity to pull people off of Pleasant Street for drop-off. And that's how every traffic engineering firm conducts this study, and these are the re results from that study. Um, and, and that's really where we are. That, 
there is no change and even there could be an improvement by the new project taking all those students off of Pleasant Street. And I know traffic has been a big conversation uh, at a lot of meetings. And uh, this is the second time we presented this at the last community forum. And Nick has been at school building uh, committee meetings to answer some questions. And we actually did update this with requests on the secondary streets. But again, we just wanted to uh, show you where we are today. And um, I believe right now we're going to keep the questions until the very end, if that's OK. Unless it, you have a question. We're going to keep, keep Dennis. Questions. I want to try to keep the questions right to the end. Okay, yep. So pro, 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 programs that overlap some of the staggered times? The, the dispersed usage of the extended day services before school and after the after school services should actually disperse the arrival and departure times that are estimated in these. So it should actually help in that case. What, so let me ask you what the concern, some of the concerns maybe I can. Uh, Well, just when he did the, when we did the studies, it actually was a three-hour time frame, right. uh, two consecutive days. So we actually did a three-hour in the morning and a three-hour in the afternoon, so we could capture any of that you know overlapping program, and then again the schools maybe you know not dispersing so much right at the end of at, at the start time. That's why we do the three-hour extended. worst case scenario of, the, of those three hours and we analyze that. Presently if you go on the Ryan School, the, during the pick up and drop off, the, the queue uh, basically is on Pleasant Street sometimes, mo most of the time. With this school that's going to be eliminated because the whole thing is going to be, the, the school campus will capture that traffic. No, that's actually, a, if we go to the site plan real quick. So the position of the drop-off is as such that if you drop off at two, like a lot of schools, there's enough space there to pace the cars out to do a right and left turn. Instead of being right up against, you know, coming in and leaving when other people are coming in, so there's, there's two lanes to pull out. Right now there's only one. Right. Which, Which way? Sometimes let me, let me there just, isn't Let me uh, show that. So, so currently everybody comes in here, except for the buses, uh, you know, in, in central office. So right now, this is where you come in and you circulate around, you drop off, and there's enough length here to pace the cars out, and then there'll be a dedicated left and right turn lane back to Pleasant that's completely separated from the entrance. So all these pieces together is drastically going to improve what you currently have. Okay. Does that roughly answer your question? An answer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, a few other topics that have come up is how stormwater being managed and is there impact on the floodplain and wetlands? And we've kind of gone over this for the for you know uh, uh, some time, but we want to bring kind of a level of detail. So we have uh, William Marr from Niche Engineering, our civil engineer, who will walk us through uh, what we're doing on campus. Oh, thanks, Ken. So right now at um, you know, the existing um, Ryan Site School, you can see the delineation of the existing wetlands. And you know, those are outlined in yellow. And then the other colors that we have there are the um, no disturb and the no build zones, which are basically offset from the location of those wetlands. 
And as you can see, you know, the impacts to the site are pretty minimal. Um, you know, just in this area of the site for the proposed uh, roadway around the site. So the area that uh, Mr. Mars is focusing on is right here. So we have a portion of the roadway that is within the wetlands. The school is not within the wetlands, and the athletic field is not within the wetlands, but we do have a pinch point in the corner, and that's what we've been focusing on at the last meetings and trying to kind of have a general understanding of. Okay. And then um, this slide indicates the proposed conditions as to where those you know, wetlands will, um, will be. You know, we are filling in or propose to fill in a small portion of the, of the wetlands. And you know, this area here to construct the, the roadway and to also construct this roadway to this area over here. So to, to mitigate that, we propose to offset the filling in by replicating an area of a little bit more than um, oh okay a, a little bit more than a one to one um, ratio for what we are plan to fill in and then what, what we plan to uh, replicate now, now you know I, I will say you know also is that um, you know because we are within the jurisdiction of the conservation commission. You know, we do need to file at some point in the future, um, you know, plans, calculations, and an application with not only the, the town's conservation commission, but also with the state, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, you know, they regulate the Wetlands Protection Act, which is Mass General Laws um, 131, Chapter 40, and um, the town also follows that, but they also have their own um, bylaw that we must adhere to to, to the um, best of our ability. Oh, just to go back and just just to recap so where the road is pinching in that corner of the road um, that's uh, 2600 square feet of wetlands the solution is because typically we want to uh, replicate a little bit more than what's being taken away that's 2600 square feet of wetlands and we're replicating 4400 square feet so that's pretty common that you add a percentage more than what you're taking away. And that's just what we're tracking here to be conservative. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So um, you know, this indicates, uh, this slide indicates the, the, the floodplain as it's delineated by the FEMA maps, which is the Flood Insurance, Flood Emergency Management Agency, um, you know, maps. Um, it does have a, um, a base flood elevation, you know, which is elevation 115, based on those uh, you know, flood maps, and, and that is also based on the, the latest vertical datum, which um, the uh, you know FEMA agency uses is the uh, North American vertical datum of 1988. And then, you know, what we pr propose to do as part of this project is to you know number one alter. Uh, you know some of the uh, floodplains, and when I say you know that, it's because um, right now the FEMA maps indicate, as I said, the base flood elevation of 115, but it's only an approximate number and approximate location, um, you know, for this area here. So we intend to, if this project moves forward, is to conduct a more intensive survey of the of the site, and in particular in this area, to nail down, narrow down that 115 elevation to you know, confirm its location. And then because we are filling in some portions of the, the floodplain, we need to um, provide compensatory storage. And because we're proposing to fill in along you know, this stretch right here, we propose to provide compensatory storage in this area of at least equal value, if not more. Um, as Ken alluded to earlier, um, the, the uh, wetlands filling in that we're doing, we provide a little bit higher ratio than the one-to-one, -one, and we would be doing the same thing too for this compensatory storage. So it's all in compliance with the Wetlands Protection Act and the town's wetland bylaw. And, and, and if you go back just to kind of emphasize that 115 and then jump in if I'm 
kind of speaking out of place. But so the 115 is what we would identify as kind of the true wetlands kind of base or benchmark, if you will. Right, well, it's, it's, it's not wetlands, it's the floodplain elevation. So go back to the, the field. So kind of de designated 115, but the, the current area where you have practice fields, that area is above that. That's at 118. That's at a higher elevation. But the FEMA maps still have it tracking into higher elevations. So what uh, Bill is saying here is when we replicate, we want to hold that 115 and create proper storage along that 115 elevation. And that's what the design uh, is based on. Right. You know, and then, you know, the, the reason we also do that too is so that there are no impacts to downstream um, abutters and, you know, so forth. So that, you know, whatever is the value on, on our site stays on our site and there are no ill effects, you know, downstream. And one of those ways that we, you know, alter this, you know, line too is to amend the, the FEMA maps and what we intend to do if this project moves forward is to send or submit an application of amendment of that um, floodplain line to FEMA to alter it based on a, a new and updated survey of the site that properly delineates that 115 elevation. And, um, you know, for stormwater, for existing right now, um, you know, the, the Ryan School site, um, water, stormwater runoff is collected through a series of catch basins, manholes, things of that nature, um, is discharged into a man-made uh, detention basin with an overflow out to the uh, um, wetlands, um, or you know, the, the brook in, in this area right here. So to, to mitigate the increase of our site, which is required per the Wetlands Protection Act, if you can go to the next, oh, we, we intend to um, design and construct a number of on-site infiltration systems to help mitigate that increase in, in, in runoff. Um, you know, as I had said, you know, before, you know, the, the man-made detention basin out and back here is um, handles a lot of the runoff from the, the school here, but because we've got all of these centrally located, you know, around the site. Um, you know, we aim to you know, keep it on site, um, reduce the mitigation, and um, discharge into the uh, um, into the wetlands at um, po possibly uh, you know uh, a couple of locations. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And then this was just a kind of exhibit where the heavy bubble is. That that's areas where we're in black along the edge. Um, this is vegetated area, trees. If anybody's walked through here, you can see that, you know, if you put an arborist out back there, they'd probably designate a lot as kind of uh, dead or on their way uh, as you walk through here. But this is the area that we are clearing as part of the project. Um, this had come up at the last community forum to really show what the clear cut will be when we put in the roadways. Um, and the, uh, the practice field. And again, that gets the program in, but then we wanna also supplement, if you go to the next slide, you know, different areas where we can reintroduce uh, mature trees and different vegetation. So, you know, we're targeting five different areas around the project, whether it's along the Ryan School, the south side of the Ryan School, or the north edge of the property along Monroe Circle. Um, and then in that kind of northeastern portion, creating maybe something more dense of vegetation, and then in between the school, and then right out front of the Ryan School, we want to look at different vegetation. Again, you know, we're looking at clear cutting some areas to get program in, but we also want to supplement and create a very natural environment uh, within the campus. So it, it does seem as if it's a it's a complete campus and um, kind of in tune with uh, uh, you know what naturally should be there. Okay. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Collins for the schedule. Thanks, Kent. So you just recently heard from the project design team, both the architects and the engineers, with respect to how the project has come into design. 
and how we have reached the schematic design level. There are several more levels of design should the project move forward. The project schedule in front of it right now, I know it's very difficult to read from, from a distance, so I can simply say we are right about here at the schematic design level, uh, which we concluded back in December 20th. We submitted the full package to the MSBA, or the Massachusetts School Building Authority, for their review. They are going to be reviewing it. They are experts in this field. They obviously build schools across the Commonwealth. They have a very experienced staff. They are currently reviewing it now. We'll be attending several meetings with them be over the next several weeks. The big milestone date that's coming up for them is going to be February 13th. On February 13th, 2019, the Massachusetts School Building Authority Board of Directors will take a vote for consideration to approve this project and to provide grant funding monies back to the town of Tewksbury. Until that day comes, we don't know the exact quantity of monies that they will participate in. It's all a formula-based um, methodology that they, that they perform internally. We'll have some discussions about cost, about scope of work, about eligible cost, ineligible cost, and reimbursement values as well. So that's February 13th. After February 13th, should the MSBA Board of Directors approve the project, We'll continue to have project outreach meetings such as this to share with the community and the public the scope of the project, the MSBA participation, and what they intend to do and how they intend to provide monetary support for the project as well. That will then lead on into um, sometime in the fall, around April 6th, is when there's going to be um, a warrant article. Then there's going to be a district vote, I think, I'm sorry, on April 6th. Then the district, uh, the town, will have a town meeting in May, May 6th, where the town will have an opportunity to vote yes or no in, in favor of the project or not. If that does materialize and we continue to have discussions, if, if it's a yes vote, we will immediate, immediately go into the next level of design called design development, which is shown right here. That will take place basically from May 17th, the following Monday, through, through September. After that, so through that design development phase, the design of the, of the project and the scope will continue to develop. More details will evolve from the design team members and the engineers. Additional cost estimating will be performed, additional community outreach meetings, and updates to the community. It then moves on into contract document phase from essentially September through February, where the design becomes <laughs> Uh, completed at that point in time. We'll also be working to pro, um, procure and pre-qualify contractors, subcontractors, general contractors, or construction manager at risk. Those will be the contractors, the trade workers that will be actually performing the work. We, if that moves forward, we'll anticipate starting construction uh, in May. In May of 2020, we have about a 24-month construction window or schedule. We're anticipating May, June of 2020. 22 for the project to be completed as far as the new building and the new building will be estimated or will be ready for a school to be occupied in the fall September 2022. Uh, we will then turn around and complete some of the move-in activities over that summer and then we will turn around and do some punch list activities. There will be about a 12-month closeout period after the school opens doing audits and doing a punch list and warranty items. So. Again, some key, uh, key milestones right now. Again, I'll repeat them. February of this year, February 13th, MSBA vote. May 6th, local vote and approval. After that, if things continue to move forward, about 10 months of design, start construction in, um, in June of 20, 2020, and then 24-month construction, 2022. And let me see what the next slide has to say. I believe that would be it, so I think, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, before I open up to questions, I just want to give a, uh, just a follow-up on a couple of things that Peter and Kent said. At the town-wide vote uh, at the April election, that means a simple majority to pass, but at the town meeting, you need two-thirds uh, vote at town meeting. So if it passes at the general, if it passes the election in April, goes to the town meeting in May, then uh, it'll be uh, two-thirds. So with that, I'm going to open this up to questions. I want to try to give everybody an opportunity to, to ask questions. If it's something we can answer, we'd be more than happy to. If it's something we can't, 
we will uh, take your name and we will get back to you um, with it. And uh, with that, I'm opening. Anybody wants to ask a question? No, you don't have no, that. No, 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 this is a debt form, but you don't have to. I, well, well I can say, can you use the mic because we are live and I want yeah. people at home to be able to hear you. you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Keith Anderson, 82 Pleasant Street, Tewksbury, of course. Uh, I'm very interested in a project. I live across the street from it. So, um, and I'm all for it. I'll have grandchildren going to these schools and everything. I do have a couple of questions, but maybe this is the wrong forum. I'm not sure. Is it my understanding that we're keeping the Heathbrook in the doing, even with the build out of this school? Okay, so with the North Street and Trahan coming offline, what is the intent with those schools? Where is that? What is going to happen with that so that, I mean, are we selling the land? Are we keeping the land? What's going on with that? I'm kind of curious because my idea is if we sell the land, that could offset some of these costs. That's what I'm looking at. So that is a very good question and has really been getting um, asked quite a bit. So I appreciate you bringing that question forward. At this time, we do not have an answer to that. But what I would say to that is there will not be any decisions made on that without a lot of public discussion. So really, we need to get through this next phase, make sure that the project is going to be able to move forward. And then I would imagine that um, the town manager, the board of selectmen, and other elected officials will take a look at what their options are. But we are talking several years before that um, site will actually be ready to come down because we do need that space for the students. And I just would like to mention that as we're talking about this, we will not be using swing space, which a lot of people have asked about that. Swing space is where you would house the students while the project was in place. So we are not talking about those schools coming offline until 2023. So there's a lot of time for that discussion, but I can tell you that um, it will be a very vibrant conversation within this community, and I think that everybody's idea should come forward with that. I, I, can I just, I just want to say something to, to your point is, as uh, Anne-Marie mentioned, is I would say half, at least half the phone calls that I get personally are the questions that you're raising, and that's something that, as Anne-Marie said, we'll take a good hard look once we know that the project. Well, I think as taxpayers and uh, the the, the, pro, the number that's going to be on the school by the time it's completed, if there's additional money and the plan is to sell the land that those two schools sit on, uh, it should offset some of the cost to the taxpayer. That's my opinion. And I'm sure you've gotten the same phone calls because I've discussed this with a number of people across the community, and that's the big deal. You know, what is going to happen with this land? Uh, it's going to be very important towards the vote, but I think there should be some answers before this comes to the town. I think there should be some answers as to what is going to happen with those two schools closing, what is going to happen with the land. We can't say that in 2023 we may sell it, we may keep it. That's not fair to the community when there's valuable land sitting there that is worth something to offset the cost of this school, and this school is going to cost Excellent Plenty. point, and I will bring that back to the town manager and the board of selectmen, but that's not the charge of this committee. Oh, so no, and I, I understand that. I understand it. It may be the wrong. I, I understand but that. We'll, we'll absolutely start getting, try and find a better answer than what I've just okay, given Okay, and you. I'm sure other that? people have questions. I just have one last thing. During this process, if we're keeping the Heathbrook in the doing, the Heathbrook is uh, going to need extensive work. Is that another deal that's going to come forward to the town? Right now, we're significantly currently investing in our budget, significantly in both the Heathbrook and the doing with electrical systems, other pieces, other elements. We're assessing the boilers. Um, certainly, in the short run, we want to keep those buildings up. In the long run, with the age of those buildings, we're, this town is eventually going to have to address the need of those buildings. Um, that's not part of this project. Okay, I would just, yeah, that's I would not just curious. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's extensive work's going to be there. My last question is, 
Where is the superintendent's office going to be after this is completed? Do we know? I'm show you. Yeah. Oops. Right across the street from you. <laughs> oh, the pointer. Uh, the superintendent's office. We'll be in the new school. We'll be in the new school. Right uh, we're all good. We'll be in the new school. Okay, I'm all good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a great project, but I have an issue with traffic in the center of town because what's going to happen in the morning, all the buses and the parents coming from the south and coming from east are going to get right in the center of town. It's a nightmare now, the center of town and the traffic in the morning. And I think it's going to create quite a problem in the center of town with the traffic. I'll, I'll field that question as well. We do believe that we're going to be looking at traffic. I see that Mr. Selectman Crapman's here, and I know that the state is also looking at Route 38. I don't like to speak to that, but because that's really his expertise on our board. But we don't disagree that we have to do some mitigation to traffic for this project, and we're certainly going to be looking more into that as we continue the work going forward. And, and, and just to add to that, we will you know, add to this overall um, survey to find out what happens to North when it comes offline. So, because again, as part of this project, the, the buses and the parents dropping off to north will come off. It's, it's not shown on the map, but you yeah, just play Main Street and Pleasant. Main Street, yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Jane Miller, 820 Shawshank Street. It's nice to see everybody here again. Um, I've been involved in other similar projects uh, through different service. Um, you've done a great job. The presentation was outstanding. Um, I had a question about your retention and your stormwater runoff, um, particularly for a butters on the east and the north side of the site, because it seemed like you only had one retention, one or two, and I'm looking more at the north and the east side of those neighborhoods. It looks like there might be... Um, I'm curious how you're going to manage your, your runoff, and I'm interested to know how much your impermeable surface increases with this project. There's a lot of pavement, but just, just go back one roofs. slide. Yeah, and roofs. Yep, exactly. And, and, just, uh, and, and Bill's going to speak to this in a second, but just to kind of show you, and he had spoke to this, that detention basin is probably your primary right now on that entire site with the parking of the Ryan and the new. And then go to the next slide. So as you can see, they've distributed the stormwater system with those rectangles to try to compensate for different areas. So taking into consideration the roof mm -hmm. and part of the early planning a little background was it went to the three stories to get the program on the site but also to reduce the building footprint. Mm -hmm. So the building plan itself reduces the overall building footprint impact to the, the stormwater. Um, but I'm going to let Bill kind of take it as it relates to where we've place these right now. Um, again, that calculates the sidewalks, the roadway, and the buildings, and all those, in the, in the field amenities within right. those rectangles. Right. Thank you. Right. So, um, you know, as Kent alluded to before, you saw the um, detention basin that exists um, now behind the, the Ryan School. And then, uh, next slide, Peter. And then as part of the, the mitigation, which we are required to do as part of the, the um, DEP, um, is to offset the increase in impervious areas, which in, include uh, building roof, pavements, uh, walkways, um, you know, and so forth. Um, you know, we will need to um, calculate um, what exists now for impervious surfaces, what will be there as part of um, proposed surfaces, and then um, um, you know, direct our drainage, um, our drainage um, in areas, um, you know, with these, um, or, you know, to these subsurface infiltration systems. Uh, you know, if we, if we need to add in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, one, two more or so to, to make up the, the difference. And, uh, you yeah, know, well, what's the elevation in that, like, northeast corner? Is it going downgrade into the neighborhood, or is it sort of back toward the building? Because it seems like vegetation is your primary goal over there. Yeah, the goal, yeah, right now it holds around 124, 125 in elevation, and then it goes 
okay. sheets across but, to the... Um, so, so we have about an eight to nine foot, or well, eight to okay. ten foot drop from, okay. from there down to the wetlands. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Sure, sure. Me in Six Monroe Circle, I'm one of the abutters. I just have a few questions about, do you know the, co the current cost for this plan? Yes, we do. We submitted a price of $98.5 million to the state for the entire project, uh, the entire scope of the project. That includes the school and the uh, football stadium? That's correct. The entire campus that you see here that was explained this evening has a uh, schematic design cost estimate that was submitted to the state at $98.5 million. Do you know how it breaks down for school and uh, stadium? Uh, we do have a cost breakdown. Uh, yes, we do. I understand that the uh, reimbursement for the state only applies for the school, doesn't apply for the stadium. That is correct. The, the town will have to foot the bill for the that is higher cost of the stadium. That is correct. Is the demolition of this current stadium being applied to the new stadium, or is that figured into the school? It's figured into the site cost. The way the cost estimates are um, assembled, there's a component type system. The MSBA formula is whatever the cost of the building is, you know, the building itself, the walls and everything inside, that cost, 8% of that will be eligible towards site work cost. Okay, so that includes the, the uh, demolition of the center school too? Correct, right? correct. And sidewalks and pavements and things of that nature, landscaping. Okay. okay. And they, uh, they apply 8% to every district, every district. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fixed formula that the state, that the MSBA applies. 8% of the building cost will be applied towards site cost. Um, I hear this talk about campus and how great it's supposed to be and everything like that. Don't really understand that myself. I grew up in this town and basically they kept it to uh, a school with these two grades because of the fact that they didn't want bullying. You're going to be putting are, are the are both schools going to be let out for resets at the same time? In which case, they'd be both on the same, that, uh, that uh, football stadium at the same time? That, that schedule hasn't been established, but obviously there would likely be overlap of use of the site during the school day by different age school students. So you're going to have seven-year-olds with 12-year-olds? Not necessarily. We were able to divide up areas. We can even go as far as utilizing temporary fencing or anything of that nature if we need to. I think what's increased probably in the time since uh, your experience in school is we have significant social-emotional investment in our students with school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, anti-bullying programs. Um, certainly we're concerned about the social emotional safety of all of our students. We would not want to put them in a situation where in any way we would increase bullying or anything of that nature. Uh, it's going to be something that we're going to have to manage uh, how students are interacting, where they're interacting. We have those issues, you know, even at the high school between ninth graders and twelfth graders that we have to manage. So well, that's, what, that's why they tend to managing element. That's why they tend to keep it you know, the ages as close to pot as possible. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, uh, yeah. older kids are going to pick on little kids. Well, and, many and, districts go with a K-8 model. And I hope I hope we you don't. have a, a really good plan to take care of that. To to because that's a that football field is going to be a wide open area, mm -hmm. and, I, and you're going to have to have a lot of you know uh, monitoring with with mm -hmm. teachers and stuff like that. I just don't want anything. You know, I really couldn't don't. agree with you more, and it's something we have to manage every day at all of our schools, so it's something we'll certainly took a take a close look at when we're utilizing the entire campus, absolutely. What services between the two schools are going to be joint? Uh, I hear they both have separate gyms, they both have separate cafeterias. What, I keep on hearing that, mm -hmm. well, by having two right next to each other, we will have Currently our, distribution, of, of, right. of, of Currently our distribution of such areas of music, art, uh, phys ed are rotated between schools. Some of our smaller schools don't have their own teacher, they're rotated through. Our shared services in special education from speech language support, occupational therapy, physical therapy, our um, 
applied behavioral analysis and board certified behavioral analysis are, are used by multiple schools. This will be able to house them in one location. Our math coaching services, our technology integration services, our technology support, all these elements are diversified over seven buildings right now. To be able to bring them in on one campus should hopefully improve their ability to service those buildings and likely have us in the opportunity where we can look at actually decreasing the number of staff that actually have to provide that service. Um, you're, you're starting in uh, leave uh, departure times. You're saying you're giving a 40 minute space between the two schools? Don't you think that uh, all that's gonna do is just spread that start time? I've never seen a, I've never seen a, a, a a, bu a, bu a group of buses and everything get out of there in 40 minutes. I, 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 so I think all you're going to do is instead of having one time where you're going to have a lot of traffic, you're going to have a long time with traffic. So you gotta be, you're going to have to be worrying about that. I think it does get dispersed. We had a gentleman mention before and after school programming and some other things like that. So actually here at the Ryan School, and I know you live in the neighborhood, that you know there are people dropping off when I pull in at, at 6.15 in the morning. Um, there are, you know, people there as late as four or five getting pushing six o'clock at night, picking up before and after school programming. I would agree that a pick a time, 820 start time, does not mean that you can expect traffic five minutes before and five minutes after. It's going to be elongated. One of the things we would certainly want to ask the community and help in is that to help us work with families to support using the school buses that are available. I think we have an extensive amount of our parents for a multitude of reasons. One of which is their children are going to multiple locations over town and they want to make sure. We're going to hope this reduces some of that. We're hoping to encourage more people to utilize the school bus to lessen the car traffic that's dropping off. There are certainly uh, reasonable and rational instances why parents are driving students to school at different times, all kinds of things like that. Any school district has to deal with that. We would like to get the community's help in supporting more parents utilizing the bus service. The, the mention you about that fluctuation, the buses are actually fairly predictable about their arrival time and departure time. Um, we know that. What's the, the mitigating factor we'll have to think about is what is the actual parent traffic flow going to be in cars? And, and that's something we're going to have to obviously monitor. It is a 40 minute break between that. I agree with you. That does not mean that there's a five or 10 minute window where all students are dropped off and it's over. It's, it goes over a period of time. Well, I can tell you right now, because I go down Pleasant Street to get to my work. If I leave at seven o'clock in the morning, to 7.30, I hit the high school traffic. And that's all backed up all the way up from, from there all the way up to Summer Street and even almost to the center. If I leave within a 10 minute window, I'm fine. Right. If I leave later than that, I start hitting the traffic at, at the Ryan School, which is all backed up. So you got a traffic problem here. I know you've had all these wonderful studies, but this is just somebody who's been driving it five days a week and, and, it's, and it's, it's just plain in your face. This is, this is what's happening, you know? So, I mean, I, I got nice studies and everything like that, but I have the experience that this is what you're gonna run into, and I hope this solves the problem. It, it doesn't create more or doesn't make it worse. We're absolutely hoping the same thing. The football stadium, I understand it's gonna be AstroTurf, right? It's a turf. 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 Yeah, synthetic, synthetic turf, turf. Synthetic, synthetic turf. turf. Right. Oh, okay. So uh, have you done any studies on how much, how, how this is going to wear now that, you know, you're not just going to have football players playing it on for a season. You're going to have now a school with recess on it five days a week for X amount of time. I've heard things about having tournaments here. I'd hate to have you put in a, a nice turf out there and then all of a sudden, uh, like a couple of years later, they're all at the same, well, we got to replace it all because it's all worn out because you're, putting it up for a recess area. And, and part of this, and, and as true at the synthetic turf field at the high school, is to engage in a maintenance program for that turf field to include grooming of that field where grooming machines actually come through, 
pull up the synthetic turf strands up while they fl flatten out the base, whatever that may be, rubber pellet, sand, whatever that base is chosen for that. So it's a grooming period on that. There's also a, a, a significant piece, and I think you'll see it in most communities, that the communities that tend to take care of the activities, not so much the amount, but what types of activities are going on. In most communities with new turf fields, you're, you're going to see a limitation on people bringing in their own chairs, sports colored drinks, what kind of food is served near there. That's the level of maintenance that has to be thought about in how that is used. The actual foot traffic of the event, as long as we're maintaining a good solid grooming schedule, should be okay. Sometimes it's the other things, and in, in thinking about what happens, what's the usage at recess, what other things are being brought on the field, how are we moving soccer nets on and off, how are we doing those pieces. Those are the thoughtful pieces in what type of materials we purchase for that, softer materials that won't damage the turf. Um, it is a little bit of a benefit that we're not interacting with the track around that. That can always create problems, the interface between the surface of a track and a field. We don't have that issue, but certainly snow removal, how we're treating the road that goes around the exterior of that, how we're going to plan for that, it's, it's certainly a maintenance piece that we're going to have to uh, take. It's, it's not a higher level than it would be watering or seeding or mowing grass. It's just different, and we're going to have to make sure we're adhering to it. Maintenance, now that you brought it up, maintenance of the road, because it is going to be used in the winter time. I'm assuming it's going to be plowed. Is it going to be salted because of the fact that you're right next to the wetlands? I don't have an answer to that question. Yeah, it's typically a conversation when we talk about snow storage on the site, and then when we meet with the planning board, typically there could be an order of conditions that there's a no salt area. Mm -hmm. So we always think about things like that, but that'll be a future conversation. Uh, just a personal note, um, you have the parking lot up, in the, up above where um, a retention basin was or was, was illustrated before. Up above, please, all the way up right there, okay? Uh, right there in 1995, I believe, when they put in the practice field, they declared that area a vernal pool. I know now that you are saying it's not on the site on the site's uh, site, uh, uh, Massachusetts map, so you have the right to fill it in. I'll have to agree with you because I can't. But uh, my house happens to be on the other side of that, and there's a drop off of between two to seven feet, and uh, you fill in that area, and if you don't do a good job with your drainage. That's going to go into my backyard. And if it starts going into my backyard, then I got a problem because then I got a septic system in there that's going to get filled up with water from your site. Um, the other thing I think you had it on this, the site here is, is Pillsbury Pond has been found and is located up on the site. We, we, we are still to define something that labels it as Pillsbury. Well, anybody who's lived in the area, I, I know one on, person. On a, on a real, on a map. Um, there, it's not stated as that, but on, on the site, on the, on the road map that I have of the town, there is a water spot right there, and it runs off of the, the creek that runs beside it. Um, I just, yes, I think that's it right there where he's got the little dot. I was just want to make sure that you got a, a culvert going under that road, so all that wetlands can drain down into that pond because that's like the lowest area right there. You want to make sure that everybody on concrete and, and, uh, and Pillsbury Ave can, can drain off into that area there so that they don't get backed up with water. Uh, co correct. There, right now there exists a, a culvert underneath that pathway and we propose as part of this uh, you know, project for that crossing to install a, um, a culvert. Uh, you know, oh, right there? Yes, okay. that you know that will transfer water from one side to to the other side. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. Uh, Phil Bond, uh, forty-three Dewey Street.
Uh, I love the plan. I think it's great. Uh, a couple quick questions. Um, is this going to be dark star or dark sky compliant? Uh, we're going to do that. Yeah, so this will be a, either a lead or a New England chips. We're tracking lead, okay. which means all light fixtures have to have cutoffs. That's okay. what we're referring to. So even pedestrian and our parking lights will have cutoffs. And again, a photometric plan will be reviewed um, as part of a submission to the, to the uh, site plan review. And uh, lights on the stadium? Currently, yes. There's lights, again, that will be looked at with the cutoffs. It extends our ability to have night games and all that kind of stuff. Yes, and then again, photometrics will be required as part of the site plan review process. Uh, so up front, this is pricey, but long term, solar, is there any provisions for solar panels on the roofs? So there's provisions, which means the steel can support the weight. The steel can support the weight. Oftentimes, uh, conduits are run to uh, main panels, but not solar panels themselves. Okay. Oftentimes, uh, that's not supported by the MSBA, but the provisions to up the steel Right. They are. Yeah. So that if the town wanted to put solar on giant flat roofs in a giant open area to offset Yes, and there's a, a model over there. So right now we're looking at the large gymnasium, yep. which is about a 10,000 square foot okay. surface yeah. as an ideal spot. All right. And the last question is the 98.5 million uh, that you said the cost is, is that in 2018, 2019 dollars, or is that escalated out to 2023? <laughs> That has escalated out to the midpoint of construction, so we're considering that to be in May of 2021. 21. That's okay. what we have an escalation to midpoint of construction. And then uh, I guess one extension of that is, uh, you know, when I do construction on my house, I always put a little bit of overage on top of any cost. So <laughs> is the town taking into say 20, 25, 30 percent just to, in our back pocket? We have we have contingencies built into the into the overall 98.5 million dollar project price tag. Yes. And any incentives to construction firms being thought of to for early finish? The, with, based on a public project, there are no incentive clauses allowed for early. We are going to go construction management at risk, potentially. Uh, that's another delivery method as opposed to design, bid, build. Which will be pre-qualified contractors. Right. Of that, right. That okay. criteria. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, Similar to the gentleman's question, would you mind speaking about the green uh, points that we're going to be trying to take? Because I think that that leads to some of his. So what the what what the building is designed to achieve is two percent additional reimbursement uh, for the project, and so that is uh, looking at the lights. It's looking at uh, water conservation measures. It's looking at uh, the stormwater looks at uh, the impervious pavement, looks at the um, heat island effect on the overall campus. So you'll see that we're proposing some sections of green roofs that are really just paver trays of sedum. Um, all of that comes in to play as well as uh, uh, kind of um, rain gardens and other types of landscape. Uh, we look at different materials that will um, meet the thermal criteria. Again, that the, uh, the the state has a pretty high level uh, for building code when it comes to thermal values at the roofs and the walls. Um, but we'll look at the lead criteria, and typically we go a step beyond. And um, our last school was a, a 220,000 square foot building that just received lead gold for. Uh, the MSBA project, which is which is great for a public school, and leads leads a good track. Uh, they're kind of modifying their systems. The other way is New England chips, but this would be lead, and um, it's probably the best measure for something like this. And uh, yep, so there's a whole whole criteria of of point systems, but two percent reimbursement. Um, if you go construction manager at risk, additional one percent, and because you've had good maintenance. On the tray hand, I believe it's 1.6 percent. So there's some nice incentive points already in play. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Um, not seeing any other questions. But one of the things I want to mention, and I, and I think Jamie can help me up a little bit with this, the MSBA has been great partners with us, not just with the high school. And one of the things is when we started building with the Ryan, the Wind. And then the high school, is we started out with the high school is like 72% reimbursement. 70. And with each succeeding project, the percent of reimbursement has been coming down from the state. 
So one of the, re one of the reasons why that is is they, the state wants to do more projects. So the, I only bring it up is that uh, in terms of the 52.5% uh, that we're going to get uh, before all the additions is that potentially down the road as projects go in, into the next phase in the years that, that to come ahead is you're going to see, I think, these percentages actually go down. I don't think you're ever going to see in towns like Tewksbury those percentages go back up. So I think it's something uh, just to think about. Does anybody else want to say Well, oh, I, maybe I can just add, add uh, Mr. Chairman, um, with respect to the, as he just mentioned, the cost of state reimbursement coming back to local communities, I, I just say this, Tewksbury is in a, in, a, in a very good position. They have a good reimbursement rate at 52. Tewksbury is currently in the pipeline for this project. It's been five years to get to this point, to get into the MSBA pipeline. And just as a, um, a continuation, should the project not move forward this, in the state, say the state um, approves the project in February on the 13th and they say, yes, this is a viable project from their perspective, and they turn around and they say, it's, it's good, we like it, we endorse it, we recommend it. We're going to provide X dollars back as a reimbursement cost to the town of Tewksbury. And then it comes to the local level, and the, and the, and the vote uh, fails by chance. The state will ask a few questions, what happened and why did it fail? And they will say, thank you very much. We will take our money that we were going to allocate to Tewksbury, and we will reallocate it to other communities in the Commonwealth. And should Tewksbury need to re, um, reconsider going back to this program or a project such as this in the future, again, to, to use a cliche, they get to the back of the line. It's a very competitive uh, situation out there with the state seeking state dollars. A lot of communities vote every year to try to get to this point of a project, and they fail. Or the state does not acknowledge it, or they don't think it's a viable project. So you could be back in the back of the line for another seven to eight years before we are at this point again on a project. So the state, while they're very generous in their grant funding, because we all contribute to it, but they don't wait around for a, a, second, a second guess or a second vote. They have other money to disperse throughout the Commonwealth to other communities. Um, a, couple, a couple other things uh, I want to mention. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, at our, we have building committee meeting, and our next building committee meeting, which is next Thursday night, we're going to lay out the, the, over the next three months when, when more of these community meetings are going to be. Um, also, this was on TV tonight, and it's going to be shown um, also on the, on the network. Um, so we're, we're trying to keep involved. Um, anytime you have any questions, um, we're more than happy to answer us. Like I say, our building comedians are open to the public. I know we have a lot of people that come to all our meetings. We think it's great. Um, and usually what we do is the same format there. We conduct the meeting, then at the end of the meeting, we open up for any questions. I see one other resident wants to speak. I have one question. Yep. Uh, I'm Phyllis Skibblin, 11 Monroe Circle. And um, what, what exactly is the amount for the, um, the, ball, the, the football field, the new football field? That wasn't really. Before he answers that question, I just want to use that term. It's not just the football field. It's an athletic field. OK, so uh, for the athletic field, um, what is the actual cost I, that will be on the? I'd have to get back to you on the exact number of cost for the, the athletic field complex. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of rolled in. It's, it's, I could look at a bunch of paperwork and try to extrapolate some money, but there's a lot of what we do when we, again, back to the cost estimating component system, there's a lot of cost built into the site work with respect to drainage, uh, sidewalks, athletic uh, field surfaces, the buildings adjacent to them, the bleachers. I, it would take me a while to pull out a number, and I unfortunately hate to give out numbers publicly because it, it'll be the only number anybody remembers. Okay, because the only <laughs> thing is, the number I remember before, before we talked about the athletic field, was 70 to 74 million, and now out in the paper it was 98.5. So I'm taking it as the difference of those numbers, which is over $20 million. So anyway, that's a uh, statement. That's what's going through my head anyway. I don't remember the 77 million. I, 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 th I think when you... Construction costs? Oh. It could be, but oh, all I'm saying oh, oh, oh. is it's so another bunch of million... Well, okay, I can, I can, you're right. Well, I can answer this. I can answer this. So the estimated construction cost, hard construction cost with tradesmen and contractors is about $77.5 On top of that, we have to add on other costs to the project, what we call associated costs. Cost for design team, cost for project managers, cost for furniture, cost for equipment, cost for um, 
uh, testing and permitting and things of that nature, moving costs, relocation, contingencies built into there, as the other gentleman mentioned earlier, we have some con contingencies built in there. So this is a, um, an opportunity where we put together what we anticipate to be all costs associated with the project, both construction and all other associated costs, plus escalation, plus contingencies, because when we submit this one package, which we have already done to the state, we only have one bite at that apple, and that has to be the entire project scope, no changes, and one project budget number. We can't go over. So that's why we have some, I'll use the word safeguards in there. It's not a liberal number, and it's not a conservative number. It's a fair, average, reasonable value that we have experience on and we feel is uh, appropriate at this point of the project. And I have one other thought um, that just came to me tonight. Uh, was there any reason why the, f the field over at the new, the pretty new high school, why that's never been considered to be used? I'll defer to the chairman on that. Uh, well, that was considered. It went to a vote on the town, and the town rejected it. That was considered. And that was because? It, it was just voted down by, by the people in the, in the town. I want to say that was about six years ago, five, six years ago, because there was, there was an opportunity that we were going to try to make that into a stadium complex there, and the people in the town voted it down. Well, I see it's a brand new one that's not used as much as it could be, and now we're talking about another well, 20 that, million. Well, that field, though, is used. I mean, it has the track. Um, all our athletic teams, other than football, are using that field right now as well, and also it's used by the community as well. So that field does get a lot of use. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. And I would say, yeah. Was uh, at any time, I, I know you went through all the, a number of the sites earlier, and I appreciate that very much. But it, it, it just dawned on me, did, did anybody request uh, getting any land from the state at all? Early on in the process, we, re we uh, met with uh, Representative Maselli okay, so you, um, you, to you, look you, at, at state land. And as anybody who's known in this town to try to get state land, it's a long process. And in terms of we specifically looked to try to get some state land in behind the Notch Street School, up by where the cemetery is. And that process was going to be elongated. Um, that would have taken years to go. As, as many people know, as we've been trying to do a land swap just with the cemetery, uh, with, with the state land, and that's taken, God, I've been in this town 40 years, and it's taken probably close to that. So we did look into that initially, right away, to see if there was something that could be done, and there wasn't anything that could be oh, done. Good, because I, I had never heard that you actually, yeah. everybody kept on saying that, oh, we can't do that, it won't work, it's a long process, and everything like that, but nobody ever actually said that, yes, we talked to them, and we didn't get anywhere. That's a different statement yeah, altogether. Yeah, we did. So, great, thank you. Also, this presentation tonight will be going on our website also. So again, it'll be on TV and on our website for anybody who wants to uh, watch it. Once again, if there's no other questions. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And again, all our meetings are open to the public. And uh, we'll be having, we'll come up with a list of more dates and times for more forums. Thank you.